work originally in the sugarcane plantations and then in the gold mines and then coffee plantations and then Brazil is the last country in the world to officially abolish slavery. 1888, it's quite a bit later than everybody else. So, uh, but it, it had a lot of differences with, that you can contrast with, say, the United States. Because uh, slaves that were brought from Africa to the south of the United States, they were basically brought, first of all, they were, didn't, were not brought straight from Africa. They were brought to places like the Dominican Republic or Haiti, where they were kind of like stripped of a lot of their tradition, especially of the drum. And the drum is really a, a very important element, because the drum is not just a musical instrument. The drum is kind of like, let me make a modern day analogy, the drum is like a cell phone. Everybody thinks, oh, I don't go anywhere without my phone because I need to be connected. Well, the drum was that kind of connection back then. The drum is how you connected with everything that you didn't see. So a specific beat of a drum would actually dial in a certain vibe, a certain spiritual uh, connection or a certain protection or a certain uh, boundary between tribal differences. They would know each other from the use of the drum. The drums as a literal language. So the complexity of rhythms that you don't see in the music of Europe. I mean, you saw some complex rhythms in music of Europe until the Renaissance. But once you get into so-called the classical period, uh, harmony started to grow up and develop so much, so everything became tan, 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 meaning the big power of one. One on the beat, one on the, on the chord, one on the melody, everything st stake in a big, big stake on the ground where one is. Which is also part of being an empire, is that you want to stake the ground. Here's the empire, that is not, but here it is. Whereas uh, in, in a lot of the African cultures, the mainly Yoruba and Nago, they came from Western South East Africa, places that are now uh, Nigeria, Benin, some of Mali, a lot of uh, above the Sahara tribes were brought to Brazil, so Muslim tribes were brought to Brazil, and also uh, people from the Ifa, and the Bacua, a lot of the same ones that went to Cuba, and a lot of the same ones that probably came to New Orleans as well from the proximity. Uh, that kind of cultural tradition brought a rhythmic complexity that was unheard of in the music of Western Europe, because it was music in which there was harmony of rhythm. Meaning, if you look at the complexity of rhythm, there's several layers. So a lot of Brazilian rhythms, just like a lot of rhythms, say, from Ghana, which has a very strong uh, uh, or Congo, a very strong rhythmic languages there, you cannot represent them by just talking about the duration of notes. Oh, there's this rhythm that goes ah, 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 ah. That is just a very simplistic oversimplification of something which is like, you can say, you cannot say that a, a C7 with a alter with a flat 13 and a sharp 9 is just a C. <laughs> it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more relationships between the notes. So we talk about rhythms that have several very deep organized layers. And more than that, uh, that's one thing that actually differentiates a lot of the rhythms that are used in jazz, straightforward, what we call straight jazz or swing, uh, to a lot of other rhythms that, that came to other places, to Cuba, to Brazil, is that uh, rhythm can be used in a variety of ways. Uh, basically, the ability to organize people into doing something together. So we call this entraining. Entraining means that a community, a gathering of several people, entrain by jumping on the same posts and being able to vibe with the same tempo, the same kind of feeling. So when you have a lot of people clapping their hands, stomping their feet together, you get people entrained into this sync of, of time. And uh, there's two ways of doing that. The number one way of doing that not because it's more important, just one of them, is the march. So the march is when you take people from here and you move them there. So march is how people get together. And the who started to develop that really strongly with the Romans. Back in the days of the Roman Empire, the Romans created an empire because they were the only ones that could take, like, say, 50,000 soldiers and send them to Egypt, or send them to Scotland, or send them to Switzerland, or even to Spain. I mean, the Romans were never and they, and they could go there because you could send a legion. And basically there were people playing drums. or So whether they were walking or on the boats rowing, there was like, 
to. And the ability to sing with that rhythm creates what we call a march. The name March comes from Mars, the god of war. So it's basically an expansion of the empire. It was how you got, that's how you expand your empires, by marching into other places and staking your ground as being an empire. So the march is a groove, is a kind of rhythm that always points down. In other words, it forces people biologically to and the march became the primary musical vibe of Europe because there was all empires right there and the march was their music. So the march, if you look at, I'd say, the greatest majority of what we call classical Western European music, they're either marches or waltzes. You can pretty much, and the, the way that they're rhythmically laid on time and the way that, that they're harmonically de defined uh, throughout most of the, the, the 18th, 19th century is basically march. That's one thing. The other thing is when you have a whole bunch of people together, instead of going from point A to point B, they gather in a circle, kind of like we are here. And they gather in a circle, when you are in a circle, when you're moving and you have a cyclic, recurrent pulse, that urge to march forward or backwards, in the case of you're retreating, uh, it's actually no more important than the ability to be able to swing sideways and stay in the circle while you're doing that. So the march is a very non-democratic way because the march, if you're in the front of the line, you're very different than the in the back of the line. It makes a very big difference. The march, march is somewhere, whoever's in the front of the line is usually the hierarchy, the higher hierarchy, the, the captain, the chief, the, whoever's leading the charge is in front of the march. In a circle, the important point is the person in the center of the circle. Everybody else is in the same distance from each other. Everybody else can see each other. So a lot of celebrations of music take place in circles. So understanding what a circle dance is. So the first thing you should ask whenever you have to play any kind of rhythm or music is this. Is this a march or is this a circle dance? Because it changes the way you bodily align yourself to the music. And most of the problems that happen with people not sinking into the vibe of the groove is because they're thinking that they're going this way when the music is going this way. So they're basically swinging against the current. So with whichever one it is, you have to kind of know when it goes this way and when it goes this way. So everything we call straight ahead jazz, that we use the terms such as walking, walking bass, ride cymbal, the word swing, which means swing like that. This all represents a front and back kind of like plane of understanding. Whereas, uh, let's say, going back to the music of Brazil, a lot of the grooves that we, we have marches in Brazil too, by the way, quite a few really beautiful ones. But the greatest majority of, of, of the grooves of Brazil that most people are thinking of, when I say music from Brazil, they're thinking of samba, bossa nova, baião, choro, uh, coco, and a lot of other variations, as we said. We do have marches too, but I'll talk about them a little bit. They are circle dances. So a lot of people, if, you know, if they come from a concept of music that forwards like this, and suddenly they want to play music that goes like this, it, it's like it's, it doesn't match. It doesn't, it's like you're trying to get the water to go this way, and then somebody tries to get the water to go this way. It doesn't go. So you have to be able to kind of find the flow of music and place it in, in a certain place, and then everything changes. The way you tap your foot, the way you phrase your phrases, the way you, you deal with syncopation. Because that's the other thing, is that as human beings, we are articulated creatures. We have articulations. We're not like amoebas. We have legs and arms, and our legs and arms have, have the, the triple articulation, at least, sometimes more than that. So if you think about the normal biological human response, which is to put your foot down, let me get my foot in there. So if you're thinking, of getting at the basic field. And the pandeiro is a great representation of that. So the pandeiro is great because it's also a circular thing. So the circle dance represented in the circle of the pandeiro is very cool. Um, so if you think about it, just quarter note. So my feet are doing quarter notes, right? So because I'm articulated, if my foot are doing quarter the note, my knees are doing the eighth notes. Right? So we move the articulations up, 
up to. That's a, that's the next layer. Sixteens, right? Hips. So when you play. on the hip, but the same thing if you're playing an instrument with your hand. You have quarter note, eighth note, sixteenth note. So it's basically a way to incorporate, in other words, you take the groove instead of a, rhythms don't exist in your head. I mean, they exist as an abstraction. We can talk, whoa, quarter note equals two eighth notes equals four sixteenth. That's arithmetics, that's not rhythm. Rhythm means you have to engage your motor coordination centers because that's where the part of your brain that actually processes complexity, recycles, and recurrent issues is right next to your control, to your motor control centers. So because of that, we have a natural tendency to actually mark the beginning of a cycle by making some kind of a noise. You do that in your birth. You do that on New Year's Eve. You do that on the anniversary of a, a big event. Boom! Oh, fireworks and big bands and music went splash. Here's midnight. Three, two, one. Boom! Happy New Year. That kind of thing. So we, we like this kind of like big splash of one, which in a way makes sense for a lot of the march music being so one centered. But when we talk about music that in itself is syncopated, and you guys are okay with the concept of syncopation? I hope so. Can anybody define that for me? Weird name, syncopation, because sync has to do with synchronization, but syncopation. Anyone? I'm going to try. Please. I'm going to try. I appreciate so, that. Syncopation is like one rhythm happening and a different rhythm happening at the same time, and they don't always match up, but sometimes they do. Uh, what you define is actually a cross rhythm, and it's okay. a very good definition of what a cross rhythm is. Well, syncopation is an accent. That is not in your food. It's actually simpler than that. Okay. You describe cross rhythm, which happens in music that's rhythmic, like a layer cake of rhythms. Of course, the rhythms, they're not, not, not all the same. And they're also not all just simple foldings. It's not just one rhythm in 16th, one rhythm in 8th, one rhythm in 4th. So the, you, often that's when you add the figure of the dot and the tuplet, because that makes the rhythm be, that makes the big magical combination of two and three. So twos and threes, you can define any rhythm. If there's no twos and threes, it's just like which is just basically what called square because it's actually physically square. It's just like square. But when every time you add a dot, so if I'm going so each time it's this accent. For example, I'm just doing a, a, a dotted figure. So I'm going. So I'm using instead of three instead of two. That's a dot. And you can do the same thing by the three over two by doing. Which is a triplet in the case of three eighth notes in place of two notes. So the tuplet and the dot are your tools. It's like you there's this department store of rhythms. And then you have on the sixth floor, we have ladies' clothing, on the fourth floor, we have the kids. Children's clothing, we have a deli on the third floor, and we have the shoes. How do you go from one to the other? You take the escalators. So the escalators in the rhythm are the dot and the tuplet. And usually if you go up on the dot, you come down on the tuplet, and vice versa. They kind of like complementary. And basically what they do is they, they, they play with the concept of two and three. So that's pretty abstract general. You can use that concept to define any rhythm from anywhere in the world. Because there's complex rhythms in India, in China, in Korea, in Japan, and very complex rhythms, of course. In Africa is where they have flourished to an extent because of the language, the rhythmic language became very 
deeply develop, developed there, and it got exported to so many other places, so you cannot even imagine anything happening in Cuba or North America or Brazil without that influence of, of. So in a way, like the world has sort of plundered Africa and, and kept Africa where it is economically and in the social until today because of very specific economic interests. On the other hand, Africa has colonized the world, really. So, so what we have as a heritage from, from what Africa has given the world is amazing. Not only South Africa, West Africa, East Africa, North Africa also, because a lot of rhythms from the Middle East and from Pakistan and, and Persia and India came through the north of Africa. And that's why in Brazil we have those two. We have, especially in the northeast part of Brazil, a lot of our, our rhythmic uh, uh, languages, uh, and they use a lot of, the, of scales and rhythms that were developed in, in the, the place where the gypsies come from, which is like North India, the area, uh, the people that came. Yes? Brazil is a very big country. That's right. And it's kind of diverse and so forth. And it is. I mean, geographically, it goes also north to south. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm getting heads up, but maybe you want to talk a little bit about regionalization. Mm -hmm. and That's a good question. Yeah, well, in a way, as I said, Rio being a very cosmopolitan city, it was a harbor where everything was coming from Rio. So Rio got always the latest wave of whatever was going on, whether it was France or Holland or England or 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 the United States more recently. So Rio always been the place where the where the ships land. But the other cities like for instance, Recife, northeastern Brazil, Salvador in Bahia, also northeastern northeastern Brazil, there's a bay, another bay for a long time. They, this was, was created there. Uh, all the cities got different blends of different cultures. And the northeastern interior of Brazil, because it got the Portuguese influence plus the native influence and the African influence uh, got there later, what we got a lot was actually the, the Moors, the Arab influence, because Portugal and Spain were totally colonized and dominated by, by the Arab, the Moors, as we were called, uh, for like 750 years. And that creates a very strong cultural. So you go to like the interior of, <coughs> sorry, Alagoas State or Pernambuco State, the northeastern interior of the land of Brazil, and the way that the, the music that's played, the scales that are played, are basically still Arab and Persian scales. They were brought from North Africa to the Iberian Peninsula and from there to Brazil, as well as instruments such as the pandeiro, because the pandeiro is actually an Arab frame drum, originally called the aduf. And some of them still have the square ones, but the round one developed. So the, and the, that uh, African influence also made it to other places that used the so-called tambourine, uh, like uh, Sicily, where you have the, the you know, the tarantella is basically based on this. And a lot of other places where they have the frame drums that got played. They also have the panderetas. They went to Puerto Rico. They used it in a lot of the tradition music in Puerto Rico. So it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's like I, I love that kind of like learning about musical cultures and how they blend these different flavors. And uh, I mean, last night I was at Snuggle Harbor and I got invited to sit in with Adelphi and Marsalis and this big man. And that for me was like, wow, it was like so cool. I actually was supposed to play one song and I played the whole set. And it was great because I got to hear these grooves and it was so beautiful, it's so complex and, and, and you can immediately feel how everybody just lights up when these grooves are played because it's a very strong rhythmic culture that has again spread to, to the rest of the country, to the rest of the world as jazz. But uh, that, to, to sample that flavor, and in Brazil we have the same thing. You get to Rio, you play a certain kind of samba groove. You get to Nordistan Brazil, you play a certain kind of coco or, or bayon groove, and immediately you see people just light up. And the funny thing is that you go to a place like India, and you play some of these grooves, like bayon music, that basically instead of being, uh, it, it's syncopated at the bottom. So I mean, some grooves are unsyncopated, non-syncopated at the bottom, syncopated at the top. A groove like Bayan is reversed, in which the bottom is syncopated. So instead of being, you have, escape. Which you'll, you'll have a lot of that in the music of the Caribbean. Of course, the Waters is also a Caribbean port. And uh, so the, the music that we call clave based, music that has based on.
you recognize in yeah. Bo Diddley and a lot of others? I say that's a familiar Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. It's, it's familiar in many ways because it's built up, it's, so, it's built in funk, it's built in R&B, it's built in a lot of music. So these are round circle dances that got involved. Clave is not a march. Clave is a circle dance. So when you have, yes? Oh, uh, no, that's okay, sorry. Oh, I was, I was gonna ask a question. Um, my mom's from Trinidad, so carnival culture is very prevalent. Oh yeah. yeah. She, so um, I was wondering if, if and how carnival culture affected your music, or if you can kind of break it down, like. Yeah. Well, uh, think about carnival. Carnival is a Christian holiday. Carnival is something that before, way back when the, the Christian religion was being defined in Europe, um, there was these days that preceded uh, what's called as Lent. So Lent are the 40 days that precede Easter. So it was supposed to be a time of reflection, pretty much like Ramadan is for his God. It's a time of fasting, of, of kind of like you kind of keep your energies together so you can have the rest. So it's a period of the year in which you recharge your batteries, so, so to speak. And the Lent was a period in which you were supposed, back in those days, because food was so scarce, and people say, Okay, so let's make this thing where nobody's going to eat meat during these 40 days. We keep abstain from meat during the 40 days. So, carne is the word for meat, not in Portuguese, in Spanish, in Italian, in many of the Latin languages. So, they had these days before land began, in which it was okay to eat meat. So, it was valid, valid to eat meat. So, carne is valid. So, meat is okay. <laughs> and that started to take more, it, it kind of jump, jumbled up with other traditions, like in Rome and in Greece, they had traditions, pre-Christian traditions, they were in the honor of the god Saturn, they were known as Saturnalia. And basically what this were is that there were some days of the year in which the slave-master relationship got switched around. And in those days, the slaves would dress up as masters, and masters would dress up like slaves for only those days. And then it reverted back again. So there was the Saturnalia, because the god of, god of Saturn was the god of time. was the guy that understood that maybe you were the master of the day, but tomorrow you might be the slave of somebody else. So they, there was a give sort of like a taste of what it feels like to be on the other side of that relationship. And the Saturnalia, the Carnavali, became one thing. And then, you know, and it, it meant different things. Like in Portugal, it meant a march in which people would march, it was called Entrudo, in which people would kind of march on the street, and if you had a gripe with anyone, you wanted to talk about a landlord that's like, you know, screwing you on the rent, or somebody, the politician that didn't like, you could actually use those days to make a protest. Because you would be dressed up like somebody else in way, so nobody really knew who you were. <laughs> so you could hide behind a mask and, and say something you always wanted to say, but couldn't. So when that got changed to Brazil, the Christian holiday, still for many years, was still, uh, just a march. The old carnival were all marches. In, in Rio until today, a big tradition of carnival is the marches, that, which actually is not an African thing. It's more of a European Christian thing. But then when we put together the, the, the grooves, the circle dances that the slaves were allowed to bring to Brazil and play their drums on the courtyards on the farm the plantations, and that started to kind of seep into the whole concept of carnival because the costumes and the, and the, and the it was kind of like a subversion. It was like you could actually, uh, as a slave, in a, in a place that was in which you were just a thing that was sold from one person to another. You were just a thing, you're not a human being. You're just a thing, a commodity that was sold. You actually could have a very interesting conversation with other people and in a coded language nobody else would understand. In other words, kind of like a code. And that created a lot of very interesting, like, metaphoric. So people could be talking about, I don't know, in a the farm they could be talking about the cows and the field, but actually that's not that what they're talking about. You're talking about, like, we're getting together to run away from this farm next month, and this is the deal. They're basically planning a runaway, a breakaway. And that's one of the differences between, say, Brazil and a lot of the islands of the Caribbean, because being islands, they were physically limited by water. Cuba, Trinidad, Hawaii, uh, not Hawaii, uh, the, and uh, Haiti, and, uh, and the Puerto Rico, and all the other you know, Caribbean island uh, colonies, most of all colonies of Spain or England or France, or Holland in some cases. Um, Brazil being a giant continental sized country, if you actually managed to run away from a farm, you could actually run away and not be found. 
And that led to the actual development of very interesting communities inside of Brazil. They were actually completely independent African communities in the center of Brazil. They were totally independent from the colonizers. So those are known as quilombos. And this was, this was, some of them lasted for decades. I mean, the most famous one is Palmares, the state of Alagoas, lasted for 95 years as an independent community inside of Brazil, developing its own languages, its own trade, its own currency, and trading commercially with the world outside. Even though, you know, the Portuguese tried to dominate them, the Dutch tried to dominate them, and uh, finally they got, uh, Palmares was over in uh, 1616, 96, 1995, when Palmares was decimated finally by Portuguese because they brought candles and stuff like this. But uh, until then, they, they lasted for a long time. And that developed very unique blends of, uh, of, of cultural strains from Africa to Brazil. Because as you know also, in the continents, you know, when the continents were together, there's a lot of similar plants and similar vegetation, similar foods between Africa and South America that if you came from Africa and suddenly you run away from a farm in Brazil, you would recognize some plants like sugarcane, manioc, staple foods that you could actually survive on. And having also a similar tropical climate, not so much in North America, where it could get cold and where the food was strange and you didn't really understand what was going on. The other thing that's very important too to understand is that a lot of the people brought to Catholic countries versus a lot of people brought to Protestant countries, that changes radically. Why? I mean, what does that have to do? Well, first of all, all the saints. <laughs> so the Catholic countries, when they have so many saints that they worship in the course of a year, every day is like some saint. So if you, let's say if you're in a plantation, a uh, sugarcane plantation in Brazil, you are basically, you have at least 12 or 15 holidays a year in which one is the patron saint of the city, the other one the patron saint of the owner of the farm, the other one the birthday of the guy, and the, you know, of the state, and the, so there's all this, and of course not to mention Easter, Christmas, and all the other, you know, associated Christian holidays. So that gave an opportunity for the celebration to happen have a lot more celebration to happen, which is not only restricted to going to church and singing hymns without drums. They were actually allowed to represent the, what we call the nations. So you have in, a, in northeastern Brazil, you have, and then they use things like carnival or a big celebration like a Easter or the Day of Kings, which is very important in Brazil. This 6th of January It's the day of, of our king. Or the, or the day that uh, back in the, in the story of Jesus when the three wise kings came to visit the baby Jesus. So that was a big day for parades where people dress up like kings. So we have someone called Hei Zad, Brazil, which is the, for the kings. Hei is wise, the king. Um, so that kind of opportunity to develop a very strong rhythmic language that has this, that has built into, I mean, I still, as a kid, I still watch processions of the, the king's day. Nowadays, probably no longer. But they still have in some places in Brazil, they have, and a lot of those are actually coming back because people are so proud of those. And they, they actually, you know, they, they, they stimulate those things to happen and people come to, because first of all, it's beautiful. Rhythmic, the rhythmic tradition, for instance, that in the Iberian Peninsula, the bull is a powerful mythical animal. Not only in the Iberian Peninsula, in Greek, in Greek mythology, the middle tower and the bull, is a, it's a very powerful thing. Also in the tradition of the Andes and the Western South America, the bull is a very powerful thing. And those are all, the bull in, in the Andean cultures, the bull represented the Spanish. And the Congo represented the local the people, the native people. So, but in, in, in Brazil, they have all this thing with the bull being a very strong cultural icon. So a lot of the cultures of the dances in Northern Brazil are what's called boy. Boy means bull. And, uh, and uh, represents, or people dressed up as bulls and then dancing and parading and the music that follows that with a lot of frame drums that accompany them. So it's very rich, it's very deep, and I really encourage everybody, we don't have time today. I wish I would have brought like, no, but you can find online on YouTube, there's a lot of really interesting uh, videos of celebrations like this taking place. Yes? So you were down at Snug Harbor. Yes. In a pretty active area, the Marini, they call it. Yeah. And uh, you know, you'd walk down the street, you'd hear all kinds of jazz music. And, you know, I could, if I had a visitor and I wanted to kind of have a little quick history of the like, mm -hmm. Preservation Hall and hear jazz from 
100 years ago. True. Kind of. Oh, I had to go to Snug Harbor here, kind of was popular. And I could walk down the street here in Temper or something. Maybe somebody knew. Yeah. If, you, if I came to Brazil and you wanted to give me a little tour of Brazilian music, how would it go? Well, uh, first of all, uh, you, let's say if you go to Rio, which is one city in Brazil that has its own set of cultures, and a very rich set of cultures, you go to a neighborhood called Lapa, Rio, which is uh, the, the old part of downtown Rio, in which it's pretty much like this. You can walk from one bar to the bar next door, and there's like completely different kinds of music from what we call root samba, like old. There's a, the old, the word samba is very interesting because samba, is sort of like a change on a word that used to be when the circle dances were happening. We used to call this semba, with S-E-M-B-A. And the semba was a circle dance in which people are dancing pretty much to a group that will be. And the characteristics were call and response. So the kind of call and response with one person who is responsible for making a very free and improvised counterpoint to that where everybody else is singing a refrain that's steady. So everybody sings a refrain together, one person is doing, and that person can change. That person is in the center of the circle. So this kind of thing we know today as a rural samba, those are the names, we call it batuki, lundu, these are all dances that represent, depending on what part of the country, pretty much the same kind of ancestral primeval character of music that as it got evolved over the 19th century to the 20th century, it started to, to sort of differentiate into what's called the urban samba, in which that kind of basic, very raw batuki kind of groove became to be melded with a, with a very lyrical poetry. <laughs> and so instead of being the, originally the, the, the samba, it was, uh, it was a worship, it was a religious thing in which you're basically worshiping uh, orishas or spirits of nature. Or it was basically a, uh, a social thing, gossip. What's going on in, in the community? Oh, some, so and so got married, so and so died. Your kid was born in that house, somebody's birthday. You know, we have kind of like what's going on in the community also, that kind of like a telling stories. But the moment that, with the end of slavery in Brazil in 1888, and basically all these millions of people were let go, said, oh, you're free. Great, what do I do now? I don't know, you're free. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> so people had to kind of find spaces in cities, and the spaces that were unoccupied, because the cities were already growing pretty big. So in the, in the case of a city like Rio, Rio has a lot of hills. Nobody wants to live up in the hills because how do you get water up there? How do you get, uh, you have to climb the hill every day to go home. So, uh, so the, the hills became places of these communities which were displaced with the end of slavery, made it up, and, and it became a sort of very economically feasible thing because they were still no longer officially slaves, but still providing very cheap labor to the city. So you could have your maid, your cook, your, your, your servants, which were paid pretty much, pretty much more since you didn't wear when they were slaves, but living right in the hills above. So the hill as a sort of like the, the, the place where that genetic musical elements that were all coming from the courtyards of the farm kind of got concentrated in the hills above Rio. And from the hills, it kind of came down. So in Rio, we always have this dichotomy of what we call the moho, which is the hill, and the asphalto, which is the city, the asphalt. So that it's like a give and take relationship because one needs the other and the other needs the one. Uh, that kind of like relationship still goes on very strongly in Rio. Now with the word favela, which means slum, nowadays it's being replaced with the word community. So the community here, the community there, and some are huge. I mean, I was just in Rio a couple months ago and you climb some of the hills there, and you look at, let's say, Rocinha, that's the biggest uh, community in Rio, and it's like 300,000 people. It's like it's a sea. You look at it, it's just going over the hill and down the other, and it, it spans a very wide area of Rio. And it has its own thing, its own schools, its own systems of power and discipline, and, you know. And so it's, it's very interesting uh, to, to follow that kind of, like, social developments. And our thing here is music, so how that affects the music is very important. And that started about a, about 100 years ago, we actually celebrated 
uh, right now, the, what we call this, the 100th anniversary of the first recording that was officially labeled Sun. <laughs> and that was by the great uh, Donga, who is the brother of Pishinguin, one of the British composers, who wrote this tune called Pillow Telephone. So it was about the new technology. It was a song, telephones, super new thing in Rio, 1917. And so this is this, you know, the, the lyrics go, the police chief is calling me on the telephone to say that in this place, now to Rio, there's really good gambling going on. Which of course, the gambling was also forbidden, but the police chief calls me to tell me that in this place, there's really good, there's a, a good roulette game going on there. The Carioca, which is the, you know, the basic square in Rio. So the, this is already poking fun of that, that kind of social commentary. I mean, look what the police chief is calling me to tell me of something illegal going on. So the whole kind of thing that until today, you know, continues in Rio as being very sort of like relative sense of right and wrong and that's goes one way and goes the other. Really good questions. Can I get some more questions? I mean, this is good, but maybe you want to hear something more specific. You know, I'm here. I'm curious, you know, when you were talking about the exodus of the Portuguese uh, to escape from Napoleon. Yeah. Uh, to go to, uh, to Brazil. What was the music like in Portugal before that happened? Well, uh, more music. Or, or, or? No, check this out. And as I said, until the end of the 16th, of the, until the end of the 15th century, more specifically, when Columbus came to to, to America in 1492, the Spanish had just finished kicking out the last Moors from the Iberian Peninsula. They had been there since the year 700. <laughs> So they had about seven, or over 750 years of very strong Arab. So that was very important. A lot of the music that was being played in the Iberian Peninsula was music of Arab origin. And that still survives today in the flamenco music of mm -hmm. Spain. It, it survives today in a lot of traditional Portuguese dances in which people are very, and then this kind of dance they go like, That's one aspect of it. Rhythm that we call this the vida, which is a very specific Portuguese dance that they, that they play. And the other thing that was also there, that you also find in the music of Spain, it was also a very sort of deep, sad, melancholic, plaintive song that's usually very sad. Very sad, and it, it usually represented because the whole nomadic spirit of the Arab people that came through all of this kind of westward movement that came from the north of Africa and ended up at the end of Europe at the Iberian Peninsula continued with the Portuguese and Spanish navigators. As a matter of fact, there would have been no Portuguese and Spanish navigation without Arab mathematics to develop the, 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 the sails and the technology that enabled a ship to go around the world for like four or five years and come back. <laughs> Some of them came back. But I'm just reading that now, a beautiful story about, you know, uh, Magellan and his, his exploits through all the Americas trying to fight to get to the Moluccas where the spice was and the, community, the commodities that were driving that kind of the spice trade mm -hmm. back in those days. And then the gold that the, 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 the tales of the Eldorado and the uh, Potosí, which is the mountain of silver in South America, and there drove the Spanish and the Portuguese to kind of fight for their land. So that's the music that was then, like in the end of the 15th century. Through so the 16th and the 17th century, uh, it basically started to incorporate the, the, the imperial European marches and everything else, including because all the royal families of Europe just have to marry. Inside, it was basically cousins marrying cousins, because the cousins were all, and then you marry a prince from Austria, and then you marry a prince from England, and marry a prince from Prussia, or, or from an Italian uh, prince, but you know, prince, uh, prince from Italy or Venezia or Genova. Or, so those things, that's how nobility got kind of like preserved in Europe. And that, of course, the music that came with that's very important. So this is another element of the music of Brazil that's very important to know is because we started to, we had a, a direct pipeline with Vienna. So it's, I'm talking about the African groups and everything on the school, but we had also very important things like the rondo the harmonic development that happened in Vienna, especially with the so-called classical period of music, that's, you know, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, that's pretty much what defines what that is, you know, through from the 1700s, the 1800s, and that, that with the music had a huge uh, 
growth in the size of ensembles and the complexity of the music that grew to a large extent. So that came to Brazil. So not only that, but the emperor, when he came in 1808, a few years later, he brought an uh, Austrian composer by the name of Sigismund von Neukom, who was, uh, he brought to teach music to the kids of the court, because these kids are living here, they need to have some culture, because they had in Portugal, and here in Brazil, they only have boom, 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 boom. Mm. The, 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 the drumming. There's no, what they call, cultural, civilized music. So then immediately you had uh, pianos, which the British built, and brought to Brazil and sold by a peanuts price because the British wanted to unload all these pianos they made, plus violins and flutes and clarinets and string instruments. So all the instruments that were used in European music came to Brazil, but that's where the blend occurred with this kind of like European forms with African groups. So you have this kind of thing which basically started the kind of music in the mid 1800s. Uh, 1860, 1865, and this music originally they didn't really know what to call it. They called it polkas, mazurkas, because that's the music that was called in, in Europe. Polkas, polkas from Poland, mazurkas from Hungary. That's the music from Eastern Europe that actually been brought. But the thing is that when you have this music that goes like, for instance, here's a polka. <laughs> is a stomping rhythm, totally non-syncopated. So it kind of like, you jump. So the, the polka is super popular music in Europe and became super popular in Brazil. But when you get, see, in Brazil we have this thing where the, in the living room the music is being played. Meanwhile, in the kitchen on the other side of the wall, there's a guy cutting up the meat for the dinner. And he's here and If you have a deeper understanding of rhythm, you don't hear just pum pat pum pat, you hear it. So that's the music that was non-syncopated, suddenly became syncopated. So you have a polka like, I don't know, 1865, Flora Morosa uh, by a um, by uh, Joaquim Antonio Calado, great uh, African-Brazilian flute player, great composer. And they, uh, so you buy the score, it says polka. So you play. Uh, <coughs> how does it go? Uh, if I play the piano section there. So <laughs> you try to sing her voice. So Flora Morosa goes like this as a polka. So that kind of like laid back feel that this gave, and then it could play even faster by, by thinking of it. So you put it down to that like this. You know. And it also allowed for a lot more personal interpretation of people like dragging the bell and speeding it up and playing with the tempo. 
And this started to appeal people. People actually liked this music better. And the name of this group, this is weird, because of this we started the kind of music that developed out of there, um, with a big, special, with a big influence of not only of uh, pianos, but also of uh, plant instruments that were used in orchestra music, the violin, flutes, clarinets, the ophiclades, I know this that they don't want to use anymore, but these are all, basically had the whole orchestra families of instruments play music like this, and most of these guys were actually African Brazilians who could play this with a certain feel, and they call that feel sholo, or shoro, depending. So sholo is a word that means to cry, but it's like, it's not necessarily sad music, but it had a different vibe than the same music being played. So you could have the music, just like they have here in Louisiana, they can say, you want the people back in the days of, of uh, uh, Louis uh, Moro Gottschalk, who was the first published American composer from Louisiana, or Scott Joplin, and people say, hey, do you want me to play this straight? Do you want me to rack it? Rack it means something. You're actually starting to pull the music in different directions. So the same thing happened in Brazil, which people could say, well, you can play this as a shorter. And it was the same polkas and mazurkas and the waltzes, too. But the bass play with the shorter gave a very kind of like unique flavor to the music. Because now you're really blending something from Europe and something from Africa in a way. Because at that time, the most advanced harmonically uh, advanced developers were coming from Europe, more specifically from Vienna. And the most sophistication in rhythm was coming from Africa. So we have those two elements in one place, kind of like being bred together, literally. Uh, you would have this music that was really rich and started to appeal. And people started to call this music Brazilian music. So first they call it the, the tango is a big example. The tango is something that came from the habanera rhythm, which is pum, 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 pum. And the Havanera means from Havana, but it, the Havanera, it's all over. It's not an original rhythm from any country. You find it in Spain, you find it in Martinique, you find it in, in the, all the Caribbean, you find it in New Orleans, you find it in, 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 the, in Cuba, of course, in Puerto Rico, and, uh, and all the way down to Uruguay and, and, and Argentina, and also in the west coast of Africa. So the Havanera is kind of a transatlantic vibe. And uh, the Havanera, all the music was developed in Havana, and Argentina became the tango. So in Brazil, they started to call it Brazilian tangos, because they're a little faster, a little lighter, but then eventually got the name Shoro. So Shoro music is like a whole school of development in music of Brazil, which is virtuosistic, like polkas and mazurkas were, but with this very unique Brazilian uh, feel to it. And that gave rise to a lot of other things. The Shoro got blended with the urban samba, which was like an adaptation of the rural samba with the short instruments. So there's a lot of music that you can play, a lot of short that you can play as a samba, a lot of samba that you can play as short. It just depends on the instrumentation, how they use it. So it's a, it's a fascinating study. I mean, I, that's what I love to do. Any other questions? Yes, back there. I have, I have a question about rhythm. Yeah. Uh, Lord knows there's almost uncountable amounts of rhythms in, uh, in South America. Yeah. So I was wondering how you sort of like define them and break them down and mm -hmm. also like learn them like you just keep on like pounding it out or do you well think about it the first thing is what I, I spoke about a while back when i said you have to understand if the rhythm is a or a. <laughs> that's a big difference because if you film this like a show like i was explaining that's a, and, and you actually look at the names when people get together to play the music what are they doing are they in lines or are they in the service so in rio we say hot hot and it's weird so, Shoro, Hoda de Shoro, Hoda de Samba, Hoda de Coco, all this music is played in a Hoda and a Circle, it means that people are not marching anyway. But for us, take second line music. The name already says what it is. People are going. And often they have, you know, going to the funeral, coming back from the funeral. This is a music that actually involved people moving somewhere forward or backwards. And then the other hand is music where people are not, they're moving but not going. So that's, uh, the, that's my first sort of like, uh, which way the wind is blowing? You know, is it blowing like that or this way? So if you define that, uh, and then you start to get into details. Details are very important. Instrumentation. First, no one uses triangle in summer. You use triangle in bio. And that's where, if you see a triangle play, you go, oh, that's already going this way. But then originally you have, you know, you go to some place in Brazil, it was really old, strange, weird instruments that they're not anywhere else. Like big, for instance, the cuica. The cu you know what's a cuica? Well, the cuica is a friction drum. It's a, it's a drum 
like a like a tom tom kind of drum. In that that front head, it's a little there's a little actually there's actually a stick tied to it. So you pull the head out and you put a stick and you tie that stick. So you're basically holding a stick, and with a wet cloth you can pull the stick and you go. You can actually make the friction be amplified by the head. And this is an African decoy for lion hunt. So, the, so the, 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 what we call Kuika today was a big instrument that was used in tribes in Africa to actually attract the lion out because they thought it was another lion there. Like, rrr, rrr. You can actually imitate, if you're really good at imitating the roar of a lion, you bring another lion out, you, you could actually get the lion, which is considered an act of extreme bravery for a person to, to kill a lion. And then as it went back to Brazil, and we still have some places in Brazil where they still play what's called a puita, which is a big one. And you hear like the people play, the vroom, 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 pulling this giant stick on the, on, the, on the drum. And then they have the small cuica, which became much higher, and they go, bop, bop, bop. and the people can imitate actually the human voice and do some really interesting rhythmic figures with the cuica as a percussion instrument. So that's where the cuica is really used in some a lot. But the puita is used in a lot of other like tambor de criolo or some other rhythms from northeast of northern Brazil where they, they use the old. So depending on the instrumentation, also the other thing is the form of the song, the shape, the structure. Uh, as I said, Shoro was basically taken up from European music and the ronda form, you guys know about ronda form? Mm -hmm. What is that? ABA. ABA, it's a three part it's a three part structure. That has A, B, and C, and it all is on A. So it's A, usually A A, B or B B, A, C or C C A. So there's a it starts with two times the A section, and then it has another section, and then it goes back to A, usually for one time only, and then it goes to another section called the trio, the C, and then it ends on the A. So that's rondo form. A lot of the old great, just like a lot of Dance song is from Cuba. A lot of music, even ragtimes from the United States, are also based on the same rondo form, in which you have the trio. You have an apportionment where you go with the trios usually, and there's a very specific harmonic relationship between the parts, where you say, okay, let's say this is D minor, maybe the other one is F major, and maybe the trio is D major, or some sort of variation of that. So there's a harmonic relationship between them. And uh, this music, for three-part music, Rondo got for a long time, still was the way the music was played in, in Rio specifically. And then it kind of, the, the trio kind of like started to devolve into being like an introduction or an outro. And now it's all two parts. Mm -hmm. A lot of the music now is only two parts. Pichinguinho is actually one of the guys who started to let go of the idea of playing music with three parts. But then if you talk about music from Northeastern Brazil, there's space on poetry, popular poetry. Poetry written by people who don't know how to read and write. So you have to memorize epic poems of some type. If you write them, they're like a 30-page book. But the poets memorize the entire thing. And these poems are based on very strict rhyming formulas, some of them very complex, in which you have, like, for instance, A rhymes with B, or A, B, and then C that rhymes with B, but D rhymes with A, <laughs> then you have an E which rhymes with part. So this uh, very, uh, this comes from the, the, the world of medieval Europe, where they had what they call a troubadour, or trovadores, trouvé, trouvé, in France, old archaic France, means to find, trouvé means to find something. So a trovador was an improviser, was a guy who found music. And usually the instrument of choice of the troubadour is the guitar, because it's portable. You could walk around, and those were sort of like composers for hire. They would visit a community and show up, and uh, hey, I'm here, I'm in town, I'm a trovador or troubadour. And people would say, hey man, you know, there's this girl, she lives in this castle there. Her father doesn't let her out, she lives up at the top of the tower. How do I get that she knows me because I'm interested? And the guy said, well, what's her name? Well, her name is Madalena. And what she looked like, oh, she has beautiful black hair and green eyes. And okay, come back the next day, the guy got a whole song for Madalena <laughs> written, and he goes under the window, Madalena, sings this beautiful, sad song. <laughs> and Madalena listens to that and goes, oh my God, they're singing my song for my name, who is that? And the guy's there like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
me, see, pay the guys like a song for you. And that kind of thing always was part of the, the beautiful uh, sort of like a romantic aspect. Because the samba was never romantic music. It was either religious or then it was gossip. So suddenly the samba became the, the canção, the song. The, the song that has a very deep lyrical, poetic poetry with rhymes and beautiful metaphors. And that's what modern samba and Rio are. You have people like Tola that writes this amazing poetry. We played one of his songs yesterday with the uh, you know, samba here at the, what do you call it? Actually, uh, uh, Ricky Sebastian said the name of the song is Basta, which means enough. But the full name is Basta de Clamar is Innocence. It says, enough of claiming innocence. You, you, what you've done is so bad, you know. If you really, you should feel really bad. And if you, if you feel really bad, you'll cry right now. It's kind of very, kind of like, rip your heart out kind of thing. And that kind of like a, so in a way, a lot of people think of carnival samba as being everybody jumping. Yeah, happy, happy, happy. It's actually not that. Uh, the samba is a, is a sort of, it has a kind of like emotional thing that the Greeks used to call pathos, which is the root of the word pathology which means disease, but it's not disease, it's more like, it's a weird blues feeling, and if you play the blues, you know what that means, because blues is a happy music talking about not happy things. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's that same kind of vibe in which you're talking about something which is very nostalgic or melancholic, but in a way that's a happy way, that uplifting sadness. <laughs> Sounds par paradoxical, but that, that's really what, what, what that is. And Vinicius de Moraes, one of our greatest poets, you know, he really says, to sing samba is not to tell a joke. Samba is a sadness that swings. And I love that phrase because that really pretty much defines what, what we have there. That's pretty interesting. Good questions, you guys. I like that. Yeah. Don't we don't have a lot of time. I want to make sure that I'm actually... Yeah. Talk okay. about your experience with Mito. Okay, well, I'm Mito Pascual is my musical mentor. We all have mentors that teach us and brought, bring us to a place. So I was very fortunate that at a very young age of uh, 23, I was actually a biology graduate from a college coming to do my master's work in biology. And I sort of stumbled upon Armando Pascual. By, he was living very close to where my mom was living. And I knew his music before. He was an amazing, completely self-taught musician. He's albino. And uh, he's from the Northeastern Brazil. He just turned eight years old uh, a couple months ago. And uh, most instrumentalists, he learned everything by himself. A, a true genius because he was able to you know, play accordion, flute, saxophone, all the guitars, piano, drums, composes for a symphony orchestra, a string quartet. And he created, he, he always been kind of like also a, a band leader. His first group started in the 1960s in, in Sao Paulo. And it was called uh, Quarteto Novo. And it was a, a band that he had with Ayrton Moreira, Eduardo, uh, Tel, uh, Heraldo do Monte, and Tel de Barros. Uh, it was basically a very different group because at the time of jazz was so influential in the music of Brazil. And Armet was playing a lot of jazz in the nightclubs. He was already an established pianist and flutist playing jazz in all those piano trios in Sao Paulo. Suddenly they formed a new group in which the premise was actually no jazz. We're only going to use the modes and the language and the instruments from the interior of Brazil, which was an area pretty much under very, until today, lots of prejudice. People think that people from the Northeast are stupid, dumb, and uh, like a prejudice of what people who are different than you, who talk different than you with a different accent, people have to say, well, if you don't talk like me, you must be inferior to me. And that, that happens a lot because a lot of immigrants are coming from the Northeast to work in construction work, to work in the service areas. So your basic Northeastern person was just like a, a servant, a guy who all, could not read or write, and it, it had a very kind of like rough. Whereas in, in, in truth, the, the Northeastern culture is a culture, uh, one of the richest in all of Brazil because it kept the original Iberian culture, didn't get sort of contaminated by all the other cosmopolitan cultures of the world. So you can actually, if you want to know the culture from Portugal in the 15th century was, you go to the northeastern Brazil, even the way they talk reflects the way Portuguese used to be spoken way back. And uh, so I met comes from that culture. He came and he originally as a coordinist and then he multiplied himself and so many other instruments. So as a young musician who could barely play anything right, I was taken under his wing into his group and I stayed for 15 years rehearsing on a daily basis, six hours a day, five days a week rehearsal and concerts and 
recordings and tours. So we did a lot of that. And for me, it was like going to college for 15 years. You know, it's really kind of like the intensive because you have to practice every day. And I, I sort of took, not only to playing everything he was showing me, but also to understanding his concepts of harmony, his concepts of rhythm, uh, through his work getting to know the different diversity of rhythms of Brazil because he writes all the kinds of rhythms. Frevo, Choro, Samba, Baião, Chachado, Shot, you get the whole thing. And he knows this so intuitively, he could just say, here's his march, let's play, boom, and then suddenly you go, oh, that's a Frevo, oh, how do you play? And he kind of explain, break it down for you because he played all of this music in his professional practice. And so his band, we all got to really have like daily demonstrations of the diversity of music in Brazil. And a very, because he never went, I mean, I went to drop out of school in fourth grade. He could barely, he was legally blind, so he cannot read the book. So he could not go to school. So he says, okay, I'll just keep on playing music and learning. And he learned how to write music entirely self-taught, which is great. He can actually pick up a piece of paper, draw the lines, and write a symphony orchestra score, putting the little mm. dots on his nose like this. And he's transposing everything. He's writing French horns in F. <laughs> he's writing trumpets in B flat, like this. He just, wow. And then, without history. And then he played that thing, so, wow, I had a beautiful piece of music. Where'd that come from? So I don't know, I just heard it. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, if, you, if I don't see it, I'll say, come on, man, it's not possible. How do you learn to write orchestra scores without having going to school? I don't know who does it. it uh, so he's kind of like, he's like, who taught you to do this? He says, well, my intuition. He would often would go to bed and wake up, dream that he was playing, say, the trumpet. Then when this one puts a trumpet in his hand, he starts playing, and he's playing the trumpet. It's like, how do you do that? I mean, I saw, I actually was with him when he bought his first valve instrument, which was like a B flat baritone horn. Mm. And I saw him within like 20 minutes go from never having held one of those instruments in his hand to actually writing an etude for the instrument. It's super complicated in a weird type signature. And it's like, wait, half an hour ago you couldn't play this. <laughs> and now you're just, playing super intricate melodies that we had to like go crazy to keep up with this, you know, performance of it. And it's like, I don't get this. But then you start to understand that music is, is a lot more than we think it is. Our match is a clear example of that. And he's still really strong. Just, uh, just played a, I just recorded two piano. Piano duo with uh, Andre Memari, great pianist from Sao Paulo, tribute to Hermeto for his 80th uh, birthday. And Hermeto played on three tracks, uh, Melodica and also the Tika. That's one of his favorite wow. wow. Yeah, so more just go on YouTube and find these records online yeah. because uh, you cannot find them anywhere else. It just he uses is, animals sometimes. Oh, yeah, but before him, it's never, he grew up you know, in a very rural uh, tobacco growing region of Agoz. In northeastern Brazil. And uh, so for him, the experience of Van like he learned melody by trying to imitate the sounds of the birds. And he would cut little, uh, we have the papaya tree, the stems of the leaves are hollow. So you can make little holes in it, you can make little fruits in it. And he started to, to imitate the sound of the birds and really trying to call the birds to him. But, and he did that so much that he really has this kind of relationship where he never thought of things that usually people say, oh, that's that bird singing, that's not music. He said, of course it's music. Look at his notes. He could actually incorporate that, not only sounds of animals, but sounds of whatever. One of the first pieces that I learned from him, I played it and I recorded it before I could understand what it was. Because my I was playing clavinet and, and my my part was I said, what kind of melody is this? I mean, I, I was like, this guy's crazy. I'm still playing because, you know, he asked me to do it. So I kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt. But just two notes, and the notes changing very slightly. And it was my part. I was just like, this is my notes. And it was after the record is made and I actually listened to the recording, this was, he was actually making the sound of a hammock. Squeaking. What? <laughs> I was only one of the harmonics of that sound. He was actually breaking down the sound of the hammock into all the different notes and giving them to different instruments. Wow. So when I looked at, from my point of view, it made no sense whatsoever until I hear the whole thing, it's actually the sound of the hammock. <laughs> so that, that kind of thing, it's always been very good as far as developing also something called the sound of the aura, which uses the human speech 
as a melody and he harmonizes that. So that's uh, one of the most creative things you know that people have ever done. Very cool. And he has influenced a lot of other people. Of course, Miles recorded some of his music, Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, Gil Levels, all these people are extremely influenced by the music of our metal. Not all of them give the credit. Gil Levels always did. Miles always did. But Herbie and Chick, I know them, so it's okay. They you know they gotta keep their own thing. But if you ever heard Herbie doing this doo -doo, doo -doo, and then you go six months before her becoming to the Hermetos recording in New York, where Hermetos had all the horn players playing bottles, playing this notes that he wrote this gorgeous chord, like six note chords. Oh, yeah, I know where that I did. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Guys, I guess it's time to go have a game yeah, tonight. Yeah, Any yeah, last yeah. minute questions before we get off, get out of here? Where are you playing? Oh, Snug Harbor tonight. Please come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Wayne Moreau and uh, James Singleton. We had a rehearsal early today. This is going to be killing. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah, come on.